shit! The original uh, Pathfinder movie was based on a Sami legend that is uh, more than a thousand years old. It was a movie that Mike Metavoy always really loved and wanted to do a remake of. We made the original movie in, in 1987 and at that time it was quite an undertaking. It was in the Cannes Film Festival and I think it got nominated as a uh, best foreign film. It was about the boy who comes home and finds his family uh, massacred. I was so impressed with the story that I decided to, at first, try to adapt that story as a film. Um, then one day, uh, I was having a conversation with Marcus. And he gives me the outline, and I says, this is the outline of Pathfinder. He says, I own the rights. I said, let's talk. And uh, we sat down and I pitched him a much simpler idea. He wanted to do something bigger than life, um, a comic book, uh, so an illustration, something with action. And he said, I know exactly how to do that. He said, you take the, the existing story and make it like First Blood with Vikings and Indians. And we were blown away. I thought, wow, what a brilliant idea. First of all, it's never been done. We made the deal that day and Pathfinder started to get into gear. Roll camera. Hey, Mark. We hammered out the first draft, and we tried to do it without any dialogue at all. And uh, I think that is sort of like real cinema, real filmmaking, you know, to really just have the pictures do the talking. <laughs> then Lita Caligridis came on board. And she turned into something I didn't think it could be, a love story. And uh, ultimately, you know, uh, attach some message to it that you have to conquer your own inner demons in order to save the world. There are two wolves fighting in every man's heart. One is love. The other is hate. At the time, I was researching Viking scripts and they all had like, Battles at sea and, you know, the big ham hocks. Most Americans think of the Vikings, you know, as the Minnesota football team or as these lovable guys, you know, just roving the ocean having a good time. Not a lot of people for some strange reasons that take Vikings seriously. The Europeans are much more realistic about what they were, which was um, terrible. Thieves, murderers, they pillaged most of Northern Europe and were uh, really uh, the worst of the bad guys. Anna lacht. Wir werden Atherida. Rick gives so strong in self-mastotherapy. The Vikings did come to America, certainly came to this continent before Christopher Columbus, probably 500 years, possibly even earlier. Uh, what is slightly controversial is how far south they actually came. Since then, they have found um, evidence of artifacts that are further south than anybody ever thought. You know, up to one point, the people thought they just as had uh, been to New Brunswick, and that was about it. One of the things that we have to remind is that this is this is a what-if story. This is a comic book. You know, it's not any specific people, and it is depicting 800 A.D. Here's what I know, which is that nobody knows nothing. In truth, nobody was around. Nobody's really recorded this to the end, to, you know, every aspect of it. So we can take license with it. So this movie, it's not a history lesson, but it definitely you know, takes that as a jumping off point. Who are they? How did they come here? This is something different. It's something that I haven't done. And I don't think anybody else has done it. I don't think anybody's told this story. It's 
a movie with many themes going on. I think they've done a fantastic job of really creating a unique look. I used to be an illustrator, so for me, making the movie on paper first is essential. Marcus's uh, forte is for painting a picture, and there's no element in the frame that goes unnoticed or untouched. Vikings come in with all this fog behind them. They add that darkness to this movie that I just love. I think originally in concept, they were kind of dark, bulky, huge silhouettes. You have to raid costume houses like the Vikings did to piece things together, and we would put them together in new ways. And at the end, uh, you wind up with something that you might not have even originally envisioned, you know, that has nothing to do with your original ambitions, but it becomes something new and something special. What we have is probably more imagination than truth, but, you know, it is a movie. We'll always default to the dramatic. Visually, it is astounding, though, when you see all of the all of the ornamentation on these guys' helmets. When you make a Viking movie, the question always arises: Did they have horns or not? And um, Vikings most likely didn't have horns, which is a popular myth about. Uh, that probably dates back to the Ring Cycle and, and Wagner's opera. They, 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 they probably invented it. We felt, look, we're going to take contrivances with it, but there will be our contrivances. It's not going to be Wagnerian. It's not going to be Hagar. Uh, but, uh, you know, we will take some liberties. This is more mythology than, than archaeology. They didn't have horns, but so what? You know, not all Indians had feathers either. We take license with the Vikings, but we're going to do something very authentic with the Indians. You don't really have to try that hard to make them look cool. I mean, you, you really don't. I mean, what you have to get away from, obviously, is the kind of John Ford look. And they had been here for thousands of years, uh, fine-tuning their culture. They were really interesting, and they were, they were amazing. You know, costumes that that I don't think we could recreate today. You know, beaded work with all these intricate designs from top to bottom. What do you see? A prophecy is coming to fulfillment. Sort of borrowing from Frazetta and Boris Vallejo and all these kind of artists uh, then made me think that, look, we should do our own graphic novel. I met Christopher Scheibeck then, and I sat down with him, and I said, how do we make this ours? Well, I think from the very beginning, he wanted to make a graphic novel based on the script. A lot of the problems that you run into in the filmmaking process you run into with graphic novels. When you approach the script, you realize you're like, okay, I have to figure out the pacing. You know, I've, I've broken this thing down and this doesn't work. We wound up working on certain scenes simultaneously. He would paint it while I was shooting it and then we would show each other the goods. And it was amazing how much we were in each other's head, uh, just in the whole tonality and the whole feel of it. The bear sequence in the cave, I would say, was one that we both nailed almost exactly the same way uh, from the very beginning. We had done exactly the same thing. We had almost cut it exactly the same way. It was, there wasn't a lot to go on in the script in terms of exactly, you know, how everything happens, but we had managed to kind of fill in the gaps artistically 
in the same fashion. In a way, it was like really finding a soulmate in that. It was an incredible experience uh, to actually do something simultaneously. It was fun. Everybody has kind of done their best to, uh, you know, come up with a look and aesthetic that has a truth about it. I felt when I walked in, I believed it. I believe this is this could be where these characters are from. It's very cinematic. We put a lot of time and energy into it. It's one of those things that we, we knew the kind of audience that was going to get into this. We knew right away that the, the movie was going to go with a, a little bit of a harsher approach to, to the portrayal of, of Vikings and, and First Nation and the battle that ensued between those two. So we wanted to really capture that, that feeling. <laughs> There's a lot there uh, for fans to get into. What I want people to see is an authentic experience. This film takes place a thousand years ago. The majority of it's going to be out in the outdoors. You know, building a forest, a sizable one, is quite complex. You know, it'd be a massive build. It's not real. It's our own world that we're building. The locations have been cold and unforgiving. There's been sub-freezing temperatures, and we've been blessed with having the most amazing crew. Rene, who's the costume designer, is very well researched. They were like huge barbarians in the film. They were really, really tough. It was to find the, the line between the organic barbarian with fur and all that. It's a balancing act. My role on Pathfinder movie was uh, developing the prototype helmet for the movie. I wanted them to look threatening. I wanted sort of hints of German steel helmets in there. I use a lot of modern tools uh, performing the armor, but I also use ancient tools, just anvils and stakes and hammers and handmade rivets. And I basically just beat the metal into submission until it does what I want. This is fairly typical for a basic construction for a Viking helmet. They couldn't forge large pieces of metal, so they built them out of multiple smaller pieces and riveted it together. When you see all of the all of the ornamentation on these guys' helmets, visually it is astounding, though. But you know, by the end of the day, I think I'm about an inch shorter from holding up all of these things. We just went crazy over it and put like you know that some paint that looked like rust and leather and just tiny little piece. Those are cloth, and this is horse hair and leather and then metal again. We also have the chain mail, which is made half aluminium and half rubber for the sound. Nice, eh? <laughs> And uh, also because it's lighter. As an artist, I understand the need for artistic expression, both in the uh, depiction of Wampanoags and the Vikings. So I appreciate that. You talk to the Indians, and you say, well, how did it look back then? Everybody has a different idea of, of what it was like. Welcome to the Witu. A Witu is a Native American structure we're using for the film. It's based on the Wampanoag style of housing. We built them in sections sort of similar to the Sydney Opera House. We added to it a outside structure of lodge poles to give it this extra spiny structure that comes up and looks really great on camera. We're going to be using the same structures in the Pathfinder Village and also in Ghost Village when you see that later. The difference between the two is that these ones we've covered in moss, and when we see them later, they'll just have the bark on them. But we've also built almost everything on the set from scratch. This is the Pathfinder treehouse. We wanted to give Pathfinder something special. 
something that sets them apart from the rest of the tribe. Once we found the location, the tree sort of spoke to us. So the design came forward from the tree. The whole tree is built in a couple of platforms that we've leveled up. And these poles, again, are steel poles, which we've made look like trees. We're actually thickening the trunk of the tree to make it a little bit bigger. And of course, the staircase we built, this is all steel construction that's made to look organic. You've seen the Pathfinder Village, and now we're taking you to the burial ground. Half of this rock that you see is fake, actually. It's all hollow, it's foam. It's to help create a ledge that's lower down for safety for the actors. It gets a little bit treacherous in points, but um, it's good for the actors to be walking on and mimic up high on a cliff face. The process took about three weeks or so. There's a framework of two by fours and whatnot under there. We have some rock skins that were molded off, off real rock faces. Hopefully on the day, uh, you can't tell the difference. Everybody has come up with a look and aesthetic that um, has a truth about it. Uh, and the most important thing was that everybody was in the same picture and that weren't elements that were jarring or not in sync with each other. And I think they've done a fantastic job of really creating a look. Day one, it was fighting an uphill battle. I've been mean, nursing injuries the whole time. It's probably the most painful shoot I've ever done. I don't think I've ever done something that is so physically demanding. I have done movies, um, you know, one of the biggest was Gladiator. It was done in a heat in Morocco and, uh, you know, um, and it was very physical. And here, it was also very physical because this kind of exercise. As a former Mr. Universe in 1986, I must say, wow, that keeps you lean. We had one location where in two days, we had 20 severe injuries. People that had to go to the hospital with broken legs, broken ankles. We've had some accidents. You know, we had a special effects guy hit his head when we were shooting up in uh, Boulder Chief. Um, we've had some nooks and crannies in terms of uh, some stuntmen. The fact that they got through it, you know, without revolting uh, is, is a testament to how tightly bonded they all were. You don't get a movie this good if the crew isn't working like a well-oiled machine. And th I think that's, you know, just out of the inspiration of their leader, of Marcus. Cut! Nice! Cut! your daddy. He's a madman. He's totally insane. And guys, you gotta lift the goddamn bar or I can't use it. Marcus is, Marcus is singular. I keep on forgetting they can beat me up. Marcus has this, has this lyrical, poetic side that is really him, you know. Passion is not like a quantitative thing, like money. The more you spend, the less you have at the end of the day. With us, it's like the more we do what we love to do, the more we can do, and the more you have to do. It's like a fountain. You have to take water out of it. If you don't take it out of it, it goes dry. You have to cut roses, you know, so that they really blossom. Okay, smoke it up. Let's see. Put the camera up, smoke it up, and we go. And then there's the side that is about getting the shot. You know, my curse in life is that I'm always right. He's definitely a mad bastard, but I, I, I tell you what, there's, there's a method to it. He's a, like a mad scientist, right? He's a passionate guy. Everything he does, it's 110%. It's something you cannot teach at film school. It's like basically you uh, show up to work, you fasten your seatbelt, and you go. We were a 52-day shoot, and um, when I joined him, I was handed 2,900 storyboards. Somebody who cares to do the math on uh, 52 days and 2,900 storyboards. Everything that is smart pink, it's actually imported background plates, avalanche footage, stuff of that sort. We do, on an average, 45, 45 setups, sometimes 66. And we always have more than one unit. And uh, so, yeah, we do a lot of setups. It's one of Marcus's great talents that he can do that. And really, the way that he goes about achieving that is 
a lot to do with how he lights and how Daniel lights and how he decides to shoot. There's a lot of room for Daniel to come in and says, you know, actually, let's put the camera over here. Can we reconceive that? Um, there, there is a lot of that. Every scene had its own specific issues. Belkara Quarry, Daniel Pearl did the most incredible shot. We had uh, quite a great crane set up there. We had a techno crane, which is a remote crane, on top of a of a Chapman Titan crane. These are these are two cranes stacked on top of each other. It's insanity. Some of our main action sequences are done with three cameras just happening the way they are. <laughs> Might refer to it as a hose fest, you know, hose it down. But he does like to you know, create a situation, get it going, and then have it unfold in front of the cameras, and the cameras capture it. What I never do is go backwards. I never go in and say, "Oh, let's change that." Don't even cut. There's not enough time in this world to cut. It, it slows them down, and and uh, and I just like momentum. Things move ahead, and uh, and and then it's like riding a wave rather than swimming against one. We wrapped two days early, and you know, even in spite of all the obstacles um, that they were up against, they pulled it off in such an amazing way. And I don't know how any other director would have been able to pull this off. I think that this job is going to remain very special to a lot of people uh, because of collectively what we've all been through, and, and, and the journey in making it has been tough. It's been such a whirlwind, and I've had such a great experience with it. I've loved every moment of it. Cut! Nice! Action! There's some intense action scenes in this movie. extremely little green screen work. What we had was something that could be easily acted out with old-fashioned stunts and then smoke and mirrors. When Marcus said, you're in a cage fighting a grizzly bear, you were in a cave fighting a grizzly bear. When I heard how urban Clancy Brown is going to be our configuration, I was very happy because, you know, they've done it before, the swords played, the riding, so I knew I wouldn't have to send them to boot camp. You know, Carl is younger and more into that stuff. And, you know, I've just been doing it too long and, you know, like to let these guys that are the doubles earn their living. There's not a day that's gone by that I haven't been injured on this film. This has been the most grueling, dangerous, hardworking film that I've ever done. There are horse stunts in there that I didn't think could be done. For the actors to act next to the horses was very hard. Oh. It's been dangerous, really dangerous. I mean, there was one week where uh, 14 or 15 crew members went down with broken ankles, twisted ankles, uh, compressed necks, skull fractures. I mean, it's been intense. There's a scene where um, Carl is jumping a horse as it's running through muddy terrain, and then horseman Carl and the horse take a big tumble. The horse was trained to do that. Yeah, yeah. 